Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's session, which is a joint teaching webinar between the FRCS Mentor Group and ORUK. My name is Nikki Evans, and I will be your host for this evening. The rest of the faculty include Imogen and Hannah from ORUK, and my fellow mentors, Shuan, Hani, David, and Hussam. Um, this evening, we are delighted to welcome Mr. Mark Latimer and Mr. Prani Budave who are both consultant orthopaedic surgeons at Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, Mr. Latimer graduated from both Oxford and Cambridge in 1997 and did his orthopaedic specialist training on the East Anglia rotation and Cambridge. He was awarded a prestigious Ingham Fellowship in, in Sydney and worked with Dr. David Little. Um, and earlier this year, he was awarded the Certificate of Excellence from the I Want Great Care group. <clears throat> so this evening's lecture uh, will be more interactive than usual. So um, we will be having some case discussions with some um, teaching points and tips for the exam throughout the um, webinar. Um, and for that reason, we'd ask for people to volunteer to have some Viva practice with Mr. Latimer. And... Um, Mr. Badav during the um, session. Now this part of the session will be recorded. So if you don't want to be um, recorded, please let us know. Um, as always, we ask if you have any questions to put them in the chat and we will keep an eye on that. We'll ask any questions at the end of the session. Um, <clears throat> any, any participants who wish to stay on fiber practice, please raise your hand and let Hannah and Imogen know um, whether you want to be part of the webinar or whether you want to be the practice at the end or whether you want to do both, which is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> we do understand that putting yourself forward in this forum is really stressful, um, but we're all here to help. We're, all of us have been through this and it is the best way to get that training that you need for the exam, particularly with regards to your technique. Um, and, you know, as we all know, having passed the exam and quite recently, we've had some positive feedback from people who've been in this group as a participant who have also passed the exam in the last week. So congratulations to them. Um, and so this way of teaching does actually work. So our next course <clears throat> for the exam will be on Thursday, the 2nd of September, and there are participant and observer spaces available. You can book this via the ORUK website, and it's on a Thursday, so you'll need to remember to book study leave early. Um, we recommend our textbooks from ORUK and ourselves. <clears throat> and without any further delay, I am honoured to hand over to Mr Latimer. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Nikki. I will just get, uh, share screen. Um, as I'm um, sharing screen, please, please do um, enthusiastically put yourself forward for um, the case discussions, because um, I, I can't emphasize what Nikki said strongly enough, that the way to learn is actually through, through, um, through to some degree, putting yourself to the test. And that's that's what I would I would really really um, like um, everyone to do. It's this is nothing to do with sort of um, proving one another to be um, sort of better or clever. It's all about working together um, to to um, to help you guys to achieve your goal. Which um, for the purposes of this evening, I. I trust for, for, for all of us really is, is, to, is to pass the FRCS and um, to sort of proceed on in a, in a, in a career in orthopaedics. Um, let me again introduce myself, although Nikki has already done that um, very flatteringly. Um, my, my name is Mark Latimer. Um, I'm a children's orthopaedic surgeon primarily, although um, I, I, I do also do some adult work. I'm still on the adult trauma rotor at Cambridge. So I have a fairly um, general practice. Um, and my background in orthopaedics, as, as, as Nikki said, is that I, 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 my background in paediatric orthopaedics was, was a fellowship year um, at the Children's Hospital in Sydney with, with Professor David Little and, and Michael Belmore, um, which was a very, um, a, a very intense experience. 
um, uh, for those of you who, who keep a, a careful logbook, I did 850 cases in a year. Um, I, some of you will say, I suspect, um, that's not many. Um, uh, in comparison to training in the UK, that's, that's quite a lot. So um, one of the things that I want you to be confident about by the end of um, this evening's um, uh, webinar is in discriminating um, between those things which are friendly and benign and those things which have the potential to come and bite us. I, I, this, I, I'm going to ask, um, uh, is it Metwali Saad Ahmad? Um, who has his hand up? This this is not the question you're expecting, but can can you unmute unmute yourself? Or I, I'll ask. Uh, I'll uh, um, unmute you. Um, do you do you have any um, idea what sort of animal this might be? Whales. I think it's whales. Uh, yeah. So I that that's you, you're you're almost certainly right. It it has a sort of certain cetacean. Um, profile to it. Would you be confident enough that it is a friendly dolphin to actually to jump in the sea and, and, and have a swim with it? No, oh, exactly, yes. Well, you, you, most, I, I wouldn't. As, as somebody who, um, who, who spent a year in Australia, um, although dorsal fins on the surface often are friendly dolphins and it's good fun to swim with dolphins, um, Every now and again, this is what the dorsal fin turns out to be. It turns out to be something um, that's dangerous and, and comes um, uh, comes to bite you. Um, and why on earth are we talking about um, dolphins and sharks in an orthopedic lecture? Well, the, the answer is that one, one of the things that um, that we need to, um, to to sort of learn together is how to, um, to fairly quickly assess um, from what sometimes, particularly in children, are fairly subtle and fairly non-specific signs, whether or not what lies beneath the surface is something benign or something dangerous. So when, when I'm talking about dolphins and sharks, I'm talking about the difference between, you know, a simple, um, torus fracture of the wrist and something which actually turns out to be osteomyelitis or or or, 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 or some sort of um, neoplastic pro process and discriminating between the one and the other is, is 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 particularly difficult i think in children because they so often can't tell us exactly what's going on um the the um the remit of the of the frcs essentially is to identify those people um, who uh, can demonstrate an ability to work competently at the level of a newly appointed consultant, to be able to identify emergency presentations, also to recognize your limitations and to know how and when to get help. Um, and it really is as simple as that. It's not simple, it's, it's challenging, it's, it's, a, it's a big and, um, and, and broad, uh, base knowledge that's required and, and also an ability to, to, to think and to reason. Um, I'm going to pass this one on. Um, well, no, actually, uh, since you answered so beautifully well, uh, Metwali, um, forgive me if I'm not um, pronouncing your name um, correctly. Um, do, you, do you have any idea who this might be? I'll, I'll ask you some proper orthopedic questions later, I promise. Uh, you're on mute again. I am not sure, but this I can say is Aristotle. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, so I don't think I, I don't think um, anybody knows um, terribly well um, what either Aristotle or this chap looked like, and they were they were very nearly contemporaries. Anybody from the audience want to hazard a guess um, who this is? This this is this is Socrates, um, and so Socrates. Socrates very famously, so Socrates may be regarded as one of the um, pioneers of teaching. And what Socrates, after trying various methods of teaching, um, established and then demonstrated was that the best way to teach is not to tell people things, 
um, but to ask them questions. And, and so that's what we're going to do today. Some of the cases will be very difficult. Um, the fact that they're difficult um, doesn't mean that they um, should, in, in a sense, represent any more of a challenge to you than the ones which seem on the face of it to be more straightforward. If you're faced with a difficult case, it's not necessarily esoteric um, detail that's, that's being requested of you. What, what, what's being requested of you is an ability to think logically um, and to, to try to, um, to, to, to demonstrate the clarity of thought in terms of um, uh, proceeding towards a diagnosis and a management plan. Um, so, um, Twally, I promised you some orthopedic questions. Here, here we are. Um, so, um, hopefully, you can see some long leg standing films, um, and you can see um, an x ray of um, the, the sort of the distal forearm, the, the wrist. Um, in a child who's uh, actually 11 years old, um, and the, the, the both, both sets of x rays were taken at roughly the same time. I think actually the wrist ones were slightly would have taken a year earlier, but um, it's the same child. I'd like you to just to clearly explain to me, um, describe to me what, what you can see. The, uh, in the X-ray of the forearm, distal forearm showing bony grass from the ulnar border of the radius. Yes. It's well demarcated with very narrow zone of transition. There is no I can see also the, the, the radius looks uh, in, in this increased bound of the radius most probably it's, um, could be malunited or a heel fracture of the the fracture of the radius. Okay, just so, just proximal to the bony growth. Yes, there's no other lesions in the forearm. In the uh, X-rays of the uh, standing films of I'm, both I'm lower limbs. Draw your attention just to this area here. Uh, I can I can hardly see this. Some bony spicules arising from the radial border of the distal ulna. Yes. Also. Yes. Um, and so even even on the forearm films, um, there's evidence that this may not be a an isolated lesion, but it may be um, a, a condition in which multiple lesions, polyostotic lesions, arise. Now, now, uh, and you correctly described um, what appears to be. Um, uh, and a lesion on the ulnar border of the radius and the, a smaller lesion on the radial border of the ulna. You described what might have been a previous diaphyseal fracture, um, but we may, we may come back to that in a second. Now, now have a look at the long leg films and tell me what you can see. In the films, it is difficult exactly. I, I see this bony, bony, bon, bon, Bony grosses from the proximal tibia, it's like osteochondromas because the film is too small. I cannot see exactly. Yeah, so you're absolutely yeah. right. What, what you're looking at here. It says osteochondromas, Similar multiple osteochondromas. Multiple osteochondromas. Um, there's also some other things going on. If I draw your attention to... Sinostosis, some, some, I, I can see the between the fibula and the fibula on the left side. Yeah, there is a The fibula is short, the fibula is short, and this sinostosis is proximal between the fibula and the tibia. And I'm just also then going to draw your attention to the coronal alignment of the legs. Is there anything you'd like to comment about? So um, this isn't, this, the, the, the ruler's not dropped down completely midline, but it's nearly, nearly midline. Um, is there anything you would comment about the coronal alignment of the? I can, I can see on both both sides. I see this uh, valgus yeah. alignment of the of, at the level of the hip and also the the knee, especially on the left side, increased mm -hmm. valgus angle. So we we have a condition here which seems to be polyostotic, affecting multiple bones. It appears to be causing osteochondromas. And it may or may not be causing some bowing of the radius, although I'm perfectly prepared to accept it might have been a previous fracture, and maybe some genuvalgum, slightly asymmetric genuvalgum. Actually, I haven't put the angles on, but the left leg was somewhat more valgus than the right leg. So what, what, what do you think um, would tie all of those findings in together? What, what is this condition? 
this polyosteptic lesions are most probably multiple hereditary exostosis. Um, and do you happen to know the inheritance pattern? It is an autosomal dominant Very good. inheritance due to AXT gene affection XT1 or 2. Very good. That's exactly right. Um, so it's an autosomal dominant inherited pattern, and there are two well defined um, genetic defects in the EXT1 and the EXT2 genes. Um, just for a little bit of, so this is outside of the context of the viva, just for your interest, um, actually the Evelina Hospital St. Thomas's in London is actually is further interrogating the different um, genetics um, and relating the different genetics um, even between patients with multiple hereditary osteoporosis and relating it to the phenotype um, and trying, trying to actually um, better relate um, uh, genetic, the, the genetic basis to the, to, to the phenotype, not only in terms of um, the number of osteochondromas, perhaps also the, 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 the tendency to bony deformity, um, but actually also looking at long-term, um, lifelong malignant transformation. Um, what, what, are the, what are the treatment principles here, Dr. Ivy? The treatment principles here is to maintain the uh, correct the the presence of if any deformities to maintain the leg length if there is any leg length discrepancy if there is any angular deformity and to follow up to if there is any ch possibility of malignant change which is remote but should be considered during the follow up of this patient. Do you know? Do you know? Since you raise um, malignant transformation, do you, do you know how you would? Um, differentiate an osteochondroma undergoing malignant transformation from one which you are confident was benign. From the history, if there is any recent change in the size of the lesion, if there is a recent in onset of pain, uh, the second thing is the MRI, MRI of the lesion showing the, the size, assessing the thickness of the articular cap, if it's more than one centimeter, there is the possibility of malignant transformation. Yes, it should be said that that that, um, that threshold one centimeter applies to um, skeletally mature individuals. What for? So the so growth pain or a cartilage cap greater than a centimeter from depth um, in a skeletally mature individual indicates the likelihood of, or, or the, the possibility of malignant transformation. So. As with everything in orthopedics, to some extent, the treatment goals are maximize function, minimize pain, um, and, and that's that's the, um, the, the the treatment goal here. Not to take out every lesion, not by any means, but to to take out those lesions which are causing uh, pain or local um, uh, progression effects, and also to, to uh, make sure you maintain. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand on to, if I may, Mohamed Arubi. If you've been kind enough, Mohamed, to unmute. Um, what's this condition? Have a look at, hopefully, you can see um, a, um, an AP pelvis for hips and frog lateral um, of the same patient. Awesome. Uh I think I can be heard now. Is my yes. voice clear? Yeah, so I can see an AP. Yeah, so I can see an EP and the frog and the frog position of immature pelvis showing a decrease of epiphysis uh, height in the left hip, I assume, with a sign of fragmentation. And um, there is uh, a radiological evidence of a vascular causes of epiphysis, which cor um, corresponded to Percy's disease. Yes. Okay. If I told you that this was um, a six-year-old boy, um, and indeed that um, that uh, it was Percy's disease, firstly, how how would you? Um, and this was actually the first presentation of six-year-old boy with Percy's disease. How, how would you counsel his parents? What would what would you say to 
to the to the boy and to his his parents about um, how would you express to them what the condition is and how it's likely to be treated in the future. So, um, in my counselling of the parent of this uh, child, I need to describe for them this uh, problem as and a problem which until now we don't have an exact cause for this uh, problem. We actually understand there is a decrease of the blood supply to the growing part of the uh, head of the femur. It can be sometimes just unilateral or affecting one side or affecting both sides. Okay. It has- let, let me um, uh, ask you to pause there, Mohammed. If, if this were bilateral and you brought up bilateral bi bilaterality, and you're absolutely right, and Perthes can be bilateral, but if, if, if this, um, if actually in a six-year-old boy you saw symmetrical um, hips looking like the left hip, what other conditions would you have to consider? If there's a dysplasia, especially if there's a, a cerebral affection. Very good. Any any other and so so multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, possibly sickle cell disease, hyper virus uh, uh, septic epiphysitis, uh, sickle cell disease, um, a lot of differential diagnosis. But the most common bilateral uh, hip and acetabulum affection is epiphyseal dysplasia. Yes. So. The, the, one has to also then consider the, the, the is essentially the mucopolysaccharidoses and Gauche's disease, which I think you're hinting at, but um, but um, things like hunters and hurlers and stamps and hose, etc. But yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, if, if it's unilateral, um, then the, 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 the likelihood is that it's birthdays. We tend to get an MRI scan these days just to check because it's easy and it's um, it, it sort of uh, crosses the T's and dots the I's. Um, and you said that, um, that this condition that we don't fully understand, I think it's completely fair. In fact, first described, of course, 1912, um, Lake Carvey and Perthes, possibly by Wilder and Strom in 1908, and a conference in 2012, in which that, that was the overwhelming consensus that we, in a hundred years, um, there was not very much discovered about it. but. Um, what, what, what are the principles of treatment? What would you regard as your goal in treating this six-year-old lad over the next two, three uh, subsequent years? So, um, according to the evidence-based medicine, there is a long um, follow-up series of Mr. Harding regarding, regarding one of the classification of the person's disease regarding the management and he, according to the lateral parent classification, classified the person's disease patient into a three category. The most important predictive factor is the age of the patient. So according to his uh, long series, which had been done in more than 39 uh, at, uh, pediatric uh, hospital centers done by multiple surgeons and a lot of, uh, of person's patients, they discovered that uh, in a class a and C, there is no any effect of the treatment plan, while in a B a category in particular, and in presence of the age less than eight, there is no need for doing anything. Above eight, the containment will be, will be very effective to, to uh, get an, a forward result, a better result as regarding the shape of the hip and avoiding any complication of disfiguring of the proximal femur. Yeah, I, I entirely agree with your um, description of Tony Herring's um, milestone paper. Um, it, it, for me, it's it, it, some components of it are a little bit nihilistic. We're, we're, we're very lucky in, um, in East Anglia to work alongside a chap called Tony Catterall, who's retired now, but used to work at, um, at Great Jordan Street and Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, and um, he, he's he's a very great expert in Perth. He's a proper little out in um, in Sydney. I work with equally, and I, they 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 would regard the principle of treatment as concentric containment. Basically, there's not very much you can do about um, femoral head collapse. There's been lots of techniques described, but none of them 
um, terribly effective if one was terribly effective with all um, doing it. Um, but but what you what you do want to um, achieve is concentric containment. So when the hip starts to subluxate, you need to do something about it. Um, and a, a very a, an easy next thing to do, which applies to quite a lot of hip related conditions, if you want to sort of hedge your bets and say something fairly neutral that can't be criticised, um, is to do an arthrogram. And I'm, I'm going to show you the, this picture of an arthrogram. There's a yellow line on my screen. I don't know if that's on everyone else's screen. Um, but it, this is an air arthrogram. And I'm a great fan when I'm um, training my trainees how to do arthrograms, that they inject a little bit of air before they inject any dye. Because um, I'm not sure if this expression translates to university, but it, 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 it avoids blotting one's copybook. It avoids um, injecting a whole load of dye, which then obscures, obscures the region um, before effectively getting it into the joint. Um, good. OK, I am now going to move on, if I may, to Haytham uh, Ella Wadley. Um, Haytham, would you be kind enough to um, unmute yourself? OK. Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a super tricky one. Do you want to take on a super tricky one? So th this is this is the sort of case, Nathan, where I'm yeah. not, not really looking for specific diagnoses. I'm, I'm yeah. looking for sort of broad brush categories, okay? Um, yeah. And importantly, okay, she's five um, because there aren't the normal, possibly the normal hints of skeletal um, uh, development in terms of femoral head ossification and so forth on the, 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 the x-rays. So she's five and she's on the first centile of the height, i.e. if you line up 100 girls of her age, um, she would be one of the, she would be the, the, the shortest in the 100 on average. Um, describe what you see and tell me what sort of broad category of condition you think this might be. So this is X-ray of uh, pelvis and post-bruxipal femurs showing uh, bilateral uh, coxavara and uh, there is uh, a decrease, uh, the head uh, ossification is smaller than usual at its age and uh, also the uh, acetabular uh, uh, trochanteric distance is shortened and it seems to be uh, Regarding the history, she seems to be syndromic, so maybe she's dysplasia type of uh, congenital coxavara. Uh, there is types, there is uh, um, congenital, developmental, and uh, acquired due to many causes like syndromic or dysplasia or due to infection or in other causes. It is a dysplasia. Yeah. Um, and you have described it beautifully actually um there is coxavara there's delayed epiphyseal ossification um, yeah. what sorts of dysplasias and and yet the pelvis not doesn't look completely normal but the acetabulum looks relatively um well formed what 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 sort of dysplasia do you think this might be yeah, mostly uh, physical dysplasia. Yeah, so, that's affecting the faces mostly. So this could potentially be a multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. As yeah. it happens, it's not. It's spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, but it, it could be equally either. What what yeah. sort of thing? So what 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 do you think are the principles of treatment in a condition? that I'm willing to bet you've never treated. In fact, you may not have ever even um, uh, encountered somebody with some of your dysplasia. Yeah. And, and that's, not, that's not the point in a sense. The point is, um, what, what are the orthopedic principles that we would apply to this, for you and me both, relatively unfamiliar? Um, yeah, so the principle of treatment of correcting the uh, coxal virus and uh, with uh, the rotation 
proximal femoral osteotomy to restore the neck shaft angle and also reduce the calcium uh, minor epiphyseal angle and also restore the uh, uh, stabular uh, trochanteric distance, is, is, is distance and also sometimes we need to uh, achieve normal antiversion of the femur and to get the physial line more transverse to allow healing and avoid any more uh, uh, virus. Very nicely expressed. And in fact, that is the, not the next step that I took, but it is the step that I took, um, as it were, having leapfrogged the next step. So this, this girl now has had bilateral um, valgus proximal femoral osteotomies. But um, I'm going to take you back to what I said to Mohammed about kids. You can very, very rarely be criticised by, by doing an arthrogram. Absolutely. Um, and this arthrogram for me is interesting. It shows that actually as you abduct the hip, the, um, the, uh, the, the medial cooling increases, i.e. The, it subluxates. As you add yeah. up AD duct, as you cross the legs across, actually the, the, um, the, uh, the congruency of the hip was improved. And that's why I was very confident to do a valgus osteotomy. Thank you. Let us well, now move on to action. Bawa. And then after this next case, I think I'll hand over to the wonderful Mr. It's ready. So, uh, oh yeah, no. So this is this is I, I trust um, for you um, uh, actually back into possibly more more familiar territory. So um, hopefully you can see again a frog lateral and a nape pelvis for hips. Um, would you like to describe what you can see? Uh, could you unmute? Are you? Hi, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so these are um, AP and uh, uh, frog leg lateral radiographs of this. And thank you for putting your video on. I like to speak to people as close as possible to the concept of face to face. Carry on. I recognize yeah. it's not possible for everyone. Uh, so these are AP and um, frog leg lateral radiographs um, of the skeletally immature patient. Um, they're showing um, that, especially on the right hip, the client's line is passing above the epiphysis. Um, so this appears to be a case of a slipped upper femoral um, epiphysis. Um, the left hip uh, seems reasonably normal to me. Um, so, so actually, if I told you that this child had, um, that this, this is a 14 year old boy, it was a real case who I have operated on, a 14 year old boy who actually had been limping on and off for six months, but he could walk. How, how do you um, classify slipped up femoral epiphyses in a way which both guides management and predicts prognosis? So that would be um, either an acute or a chronic slip. In this case, it's a chronic slip. I can see on the radiographs that there's some uh, calcification feromedially, uh, which points that uh, there's some attempt at callus formation. So this, uh, yeah. as you said, has uh, been going I on for about six months. There's some metaphyseal beaking, which, which um, hints at the chronicity. That's not exactly what I asked though, if I, if I may. I would like you to, to tell me what feature of this child's presentation, clinical or radiographic, um, actually best predicts prognosis and guides management. So that would be um, based on uh, Loder's stability classification. So stable versus unstable, depending on whether they were able to wake, bear it bear or not. Uh, so this, this child can bear it bear. So he would be classified into a stable slip and that basically quantifies the risk of AVN. If they're unable to bear weight, then there's a 47% chance of uh, avascular necrosis of the hip. Very good. So how would you manage this child? Uh, your your consultant on call, so you're two or three months into the job um, 
and this this child presents to the emergency department. Mum's um, frustrated that the GP is not properly examined the child. Um, uh, when you examine the child, um, the, the child has a, a pronounced limp, walks with an externally rotated foot regression angle. If you actually um, prop him up on his um, uh, on the examination couch and flex the hip, it goes into sort of radical external rotation. That is to say, as you flex the hip, flex the hip up on the left hand side and you can touch the knee to the shoulder, flex the hip up on the right hand side and the knee swings way out laterally. And in fact, his heel comes across his, um, his, his um, what, what are you, what are you going to, how are you going to manage this child? Uh, so the principle here is uh, to arrest the slip progression. So we want the uh, slip to be at the place that it is now. Um, for that, ideally, this is best managed by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who is who is adept at dealing with uh, severe uh, slip up of femoral epiphysis. Uh, but okay. e even if you are going to choose to phone a friend or transfer this patient, um, what what um, uh, measures are you going to institute it, it essentially immediately? Uh, so I would uh, how, how could you how could this how could you definitely make this young man's hip worse? So by attempting an acute reduction so that would... yeah, no, so I don't think you would you would achieve anything by attempting an acute reduction because of the chronicity, because it is stuck. The, 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 what, the, the, the way you could make this child's hip worse would be to turn it from a stable hip into an unstable hip. And so actually your, your, your um, duty, um, your responsibility as the diagnosing surgeon is to ensure that, this, that, that, that you minimise ideally eliminate that risk and that's so first of all you actually ask him to be non-weight very as simple as that now um let, let us let us imagine that um that uh that you are um this time at, at the receiving hospital um and um that you are in the position of being a the the receiving pediatric orthopedic surgeon at what what options are open to you how would you, um, how would you advise the parents? How would you consent the parents? What would you actually do if you were not the man um, passing the buck, but the man receiving the buck, the man not passing the baton, but receiving the baton? So um, I would opt for in situ pinning uh, of of the right here, but I would explain to the parents that the options essentially are to, uh, like I said, the principle is to arrest the slip progression. Um, and then deal with the deformity later. That would be in my hands, but there is also an option. And it is done very frequently in other centers to uh, correct this de deformity in one go and then pin the hip. Yes, do, do, you know, do you know how that surgery is performed? Do you know any of the eponymous um, operations described? So that would be uh, with, a, with a done osteotomy to... Yeah. Uh, um, and, so, and what do you do with it in a done osteotomy? Uh, so essentially you're um, trying to um, reduce the neck back in line uh, with the epiphysis. That is with a, um, uh, that is making, uh, making sure uh, that you preserve the vascularity to, to the hip while doing that. Mm. So the, 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 the word to bring into your explanation is cuneiform. You, you take out a wedge of metaphysis. Um, uh, very nicely answered. I, I, um, I operate on this child um, and I did exactly what you suggested first. I did in situ pinning um, and we will come back to fight another day, possibly depending on what, what the child is. Um, Tuesdays um, in the future. Now I'm going to, if I may, hand over to my colleague, um, Mr. Budadeh. Pranay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Mark. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pranay Budadeh. I'm a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon between Broomfield Hospital and Adam Brooks Hospital in Essex. 
Um, so I think these sort of sessions, there's quite a lot of you here, there's now it's probably around 75 of you here um, for questions. And I really want everyone to get as much out of this as possible. And I think uh, to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a sort of quick fire round of cases. So if everyone can get uh, a sheet of paper and a pen, um, we're going to start and we're going to go through 30 different pediatric orthopedic cases in quick succession. And then we're going to go through the answers of them and uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions. Because the issue with um, the FRCS is you may not get the standard question that you, that you expect to get. You may not get the DDH, the Perthes, the Sufi, the Clubfoot, the basic trauma. And um, therefore, you need to be aware of the other things that can pop up and just stay calm and understand how to deal with them. OK, so if, every, if everyone has that, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen and we'll we'll move on. OK. So. One second. So I'm going to time this and we're going to spend 30 seconds per slide. OK, so there's not going to be much talking for the first uh, for the first 10 minutes or so. But then after that, we'll be able to do whatever we need to do. If you have any questions, I'm very happy if you just unmute and interrupt me. But we need to move on pretty swiftly to get through this in the timely manner. Um, so I'm going to put up the first question and we're going to start our 30 seconds now. So this is an X-ray chest of a neonate. And there's three questions here. What do you think the diagnosis is? How would you manage it? And what other things can you consider it could be or you could be concerned about? OK, so just three short words on there. And hope you've got those down. We're moving on. This is an X-ray again of a neonate. Can you identify? or provide us with the diagnosis and how you would subsequently manage this patient. These are quite important things to recognize as a, as a consultant, even in a district and hospital anywhere, really. We'll move on. Here's an extra spine, once again, of a young child, just four months old, under my care currently. Can you provide me with the diagnosis for this patient? The cause for the diagnosis and how you would manage them in the very in first instance. Okay, we're moving on 30 seconds. We're going quick here. Extra of a foot in a six year old boy presenting with pain, swelling, difficulty weight bearing. If we can have the diagnosis and the subsequent management, how you would manage this patient in your fracture clinic if they came through the front door. There's only two here, so we'll move on quicker to slightly more complex one. A lot more obvious clinical picture and supported by um, x-rays in a neonate again. Can we have the diagnosis, how you would manage this patient? in the very first instance, and what further investigations or associations are in keeping with this clinical presentation. Can't see most of you, so I hope you're keeping up and writing down really quickly. We'll move on again. I think this may be reasonably similar to one you've seen before today, uh, but if we can have the diagnosis of this patient, the inheritance patterns of the communication and the gene that is affected. Next one will be pretty obvious, but it is once again in a young neonate patient. What is the diagnosis? What would be your management knowing that this child is a brand newborn neonate child? And what are your further considerations? What are the most important things that you need to do 
when approaching this child in this clinical situation. And I hope you're keeping a locked up. We're going to have scores of the doors at the end. Everyone can submit their scores. So next patient. Another trauma, slightly older child, around 10 years old, had a twisting injury. Can we have the diagnosis of this patient, how you would manage it? In the first instance, it's come on your general trauma on call and what your concerns would be with regards to this fracture. And this was a case that I was given in my FRCS. Okay. Something most of you would have seen before and stayed up at night managing. But if we can have the obvious diagnosis, uh, the classification, and what this one would be, and again, how you would manage this. I'm sure the FRCS mentors can revive you with regards to some of these more core critical topics uh, later, down, later on. So here we have an AP pelvis in a 14 year old runner presenting with right sided pain. If we can have the diagnosis, how you would manage this patient and what you may be concerned about or any further considerations. Anything, any other tests you would do, anything else you would advise, et cetera. This is a clinical test that I expect everyone to know and understand why it works. So can you name the test? I'm sure you've all done this. You've done it in foot and ankle uh, rotations and pediatric rotations and neuromuscular patients. And then we'll talk about image A and what we are doing and image B. What are we looking for? What is the tight structure? Or what would you have to manage in image A versus image B? Next one, clinical photo of a newborn with associated x-rays. This is a congenital deformity that we would uh, see. So diagnosis, the management of this patient and what your further considerations are for the future when looking after this patient. What would you advise the parents or explain to the parents would be an issue or potentially an issue in the future? Next, we have a clinical photo of a foot. I would say it has a particular shape to it, especially with regards to the sole of the foot and an associated x-ray, hopefully helping you identify what the issue is. And are you aware of how these patients are managed? Three seconds of moving on. Again, a patient who presents with um, the below x-ray, you can see the clinical x-ray of the limb and the foot with the associated long leg x-ray. Just give me this, the clear uh, diagnosis that this child has and how you feel they should be managed. Something slightly more complex um, with regards to this one, but if we have a an AP pelvis and a child, obviously. So let's have a diagnosis. What is the important measurement that we would like to know about, which helps guide our clinical treatment of this child? What are the potential causes? And subsequently, the management that can be applied to address that. So four marks with this one. There's not many with four marks. We're halfway through already. Here's a clinical photo. The resolution and coloration of the x-ray is absolutely fine. This is what it appears like. I have not adjusted any um, shading on this. We have the diagnosis, the pathophysiology, what causes this condition from a bone cellular level, and subsequently, what are the risks associated with this condition? Next, x-ray, right femur in a child who presents with pain, um, was playing basketball, no problems, but presented with pain that then began to cause issues at nighttime. 
has an obvious swelling in the thigh. Can you tell me the underlying diagnosis, the radiological signs that we're looking for, and how you would further investigate this child? Again, one not to be missed. X-ray of a distal femur in the child. Can you give me the di obvious diagnosis? And then what arrow one and arrow two is pointed to? What is the name for the two regions of bone affected? And what do we, what's the appropriate nomenclature? Clinical photos and wrist x-ray of a child with an obvious deformity. Pretty clear cut. We can have the diagnosis, what the inheritance pattern is, and what is the key anatomical structure that causes this deformity in the wrist. And me, myself and Mr. Latimer have both recently managed um, a couple of patients with this condition. I'm letting it go on a few more seconds so you can scribble down and get on. Patient who presents with pain on the medial aspect of the foot. Can we have a diagnosis? A classification. And what your management would be. And this is a nine-year-old child, if that helps any of you. It's the medial aspect of the foot that is painful. Five-year-old child presents with this x-ray, um, walks, waddles, late presentation. What is the obvious diagnosis? Can you name five risk factors, which you should all know about? This is a, a core topic. And subsequently, how you feel this patient should be managed, understanding that they are five years old. Want to puzzle a few of you? Um, what is this? Is an x ray of a pelvis in a 13 year old? If we can have a diagnosis, and if you can give me the eponymous name, that's a bonus point. They may, may have seen it, may not have seen it. Don't worry, it's just there. You don't need to know much about it. What is the name of the procedure and the approach? that has been taken with the needle in this image here. What is the obvious pathology? And can you name what one and two are pointing at? And we'll talk about that. Just seven more to go, but getting there quickly. Here we have your typical presentation in most hospitals and a a uh, 12 year old girl was walking and suddenly fell to the ground and had to present to the hospital. What is the obvious, what's the diagnosis in this uh, radiograph? What are the anatomical associations? What are the things that we need to assess in this child, both clinically and radiologically? And what is the name of the main ligament that is usually stretched or torn in this injury? Here we have x-ray AP and lateral of a five-year-old child who presents with a clinical deformity. These are the um, x-rays for them. Can you describe the deformity? As you can probably tell, there is a bowing of this tibia fibula. So what is the underlying diagnosis and what are its associations? This is a 12-year-old uh, child that presents with no trauma. There's no trauma associated with this. Presents with a prominence over the right upper chest. If so, no understanding that there's no trauma. Can I have a diagnosis, a cause, anatomical cause, and management? How would you manage this patient? Back to something we're more 
familiar with. We have the name of this um, an issue. Please don't get distracted by the obvious. Have a close look at the x-ray. What is the diagnosis for this patient? It was a major trauma accident. How would you assess this child and what would be your management? We're coming down to the last three. I think this we've been through, but please just write down the obvious diagnosis. The risk factors associated for this to occur in a child. And I'll mention briefly the management that can be undertaken. Final two, we're only 10 seconds behind where we planned. Significantly shorter leg, one bone predominantly affected. Diagnosis, how it can be classified and subsequent management. And finally, X-ray and CT scan. We have a diagnosis for the lesion. In the history, what is it typically improved with medication wise? And subsequently, how can we manage this patient? Okay, everyone happy? Let's all have a breather for 30 seconds. Okay, there was a lot to go across there. And we'll start from the top in a, in a few seconds. Um, tick away, tick away your answers, keep a log of your scores, and then we'll, put, we'll get them put into the chat box. Again, um, I'll go through them relatively quickly, but if you have a question, if you can please um, unmute yourself and also, um, or put something in the chat box, that would be really helpful, just because um, I'm gonna try and get the chat box up on my screen as well. Um, so we can have a look. Okay, so we'll start from here. So number one, diagnosis is actually a clavicle fracture that was caused by birth. This was the same child who had an X-ray um, at three weeks, and you can see significant callus healing there. Management, conservative, they're neonate, they will heal. And what are your other considerations? Well, could it be a pseudoarthrosis of the clavicle and non-accidental injury if it was not an immediate birth injury? Okay. Next one. This is really important. And this is something that people tend to miss quite often. This is a physeal separation. Okay. This is a, this was a birth injury in this child. What do we mean by physeal separation? It's essentially a Salter Harris one fracture where if you go um, to this, this is the metaphysis. The epiphysis is still cartilaginous. You cannot see it and it's actually reduced. This is not an elbow dislocation. And that's the most important thing to understand. This needs timely treatment. It is associated with non-accidental injury. So um, does need to be looked at. And how do we do it? Normally we do a manipulation, an arthrogram to confirm appropriate reduction and K wiring. Okay. Next one. Hopefully most of you got this diagnosis is congenital scoliosis. Okay, as a young child, what is the cause? In this case, there is a hemivertebra that you can hopefully identify here, which is the apex of the curve. And this is obviously due to a failure of formation. There is obviously a failure of segmentation as well that you need to be aware of. What do you do? Well, typically you would observe it and they can be excised later down the line if it's not improving. And this defect forms uh, is an issue with the formation of the mesenchymal uh, analog during the fourth or sixth week of gestation. So you can get a bar, which is your failure of segmentation, or you can get failure of formation, which is hemivertebra, just as in this case. And for this child, you can see they've actually got multi-level issues um, with them. We, we've sent this child off to Great Ormond Street. Six-year-old child, I think I said uh, before, so diagnosis, Kohler's disease, avascular necrosis of the 
navicular, uh, common uh, thing to see, commonly seen in a fracture clinic. How do we manage it? Essentially, non-weight bear them and symptomatically manage them expectantly. Give them a cast if it's really severe. Most patients can get around on a boot and it does improve over time. Number five, newborn child. This is a congenital knee dislocation, usually caused by very tight quadriceps tendon and subluxation of the hamstring, which then causes this extension moment. Um, how do we manage it? Serial casting of the knee in gradual flexion. In fact, I probably have the same patient here. So this is the Tarek classification, which basically depends on how much passive flexion they have. So it's either greater than 90, 30 to 90, or less than 30, as you can see, if it's quite severe. Management is serial casting, and the association is with DDH and torticollis. So always get a scan. The last patient I had with a, a congenital knee dislocation also had a graft three dislocated hip that we had to manage in the pelvic harness. Mark went through this one earlier. This is multiple hereditary exostosis. It's the most benign bone tumor. Uh, inheritance patterns is autosomal dominant, so it is quite common to see in families, of course, and it's the EXT1, 2, and 3 gene. Okay, we don't need to go through this much anymore. Any questions so far? Please just unmute, otherwise I'll carry on in a few seconds. Okay. So, obvious fracture, I said this was a neonate, this is a, a neonatal femoral fracture. How do you manage it? pavlik harness okay or with no treatment whatsoever um this is the same child when i saw them uh a year and a half down the line completely healed completely remodeled no leg length discrepancy but you do need to look at the um the leg lengths as you follow these children up obviously if you have a young child presenting with a femoral fracture who's not of walking age of course non-accidental injury that needs to be investigated for child safeguarding and you must mention that when you see um, in the pediatric station, any sort of fracture, you need to always mention the word safeguarding. It's very important. This is the case that I got given in my FRCS exam. This is a Salter Harris II fracture of the distal tibia with a high fibula fracture. Um, what, how, how do we fix it? Well, you can fix it just through manipulation. You can hold it with a screw, A to P. You can hold it with a KY, a dealer's choice. But what is the concern? The concern is this. Concern is a growth arrest that can happen and cause an angular deformity around the ankle. So the third mark for that was um, so looking for growth deformity later down the line. Supercondylar fracture, garden three, how do you manage it? Depends on the mechanism of injury, but you need to approach the child with ATLS protocol, ABCs, assess their neurology, make sure you document individual nerves, including the anterior interosseous nerve, which has gone in quite a few numbers, must ensure there's a, a radial pulse to document the uh, perfusion of the hand. Obviously, child needs to go to theatre, MUA and KYs, dealer's choice with what you do. Um, you know, there, there's evidence for both lateral and medial KYs. If you want to start mentioning evidence, you can talk. Um, we have our BOSE guidelines, obviously, if you're doing the FRCS in the UK to mention two millimeter wires can be lateral or cross but if you're doing a medial side then you must open and uh, have a look to ensure you haven't penetrated the ulnar nerve to at least retract it this one here is a right neck of femur in a 15 year old runner fracture across here um obviously the classification well the classification is a delbet fracture and this is the delbet classification and that essentially asks is it transficeal Transcervical, basic cervical, intertrochanteric are slightly similar, but obviously the ABN rates are quite significant when it's transficeal and it's associated with or without a, dis, um, a, a epiphyseal dislocation, which essentially is a Sufi if you think about it that way. But transcervical um, also has is the most common one and also has a thirty percent risk of ABN. How do you fix it? Cannulated screws, um, aspirate the joint of its uh, hematoma, and other things need to be looking at. Is obviously it could be a stress fracture, low vitamin D and things like that. Number 11, so this is a silver skulls test. I feel like a lot of people don't tend to understand this. So with the knee straight, both the gastrocnemius and the Achilles tendon are tight. Okay, you have to collect the heel position. And if you've got tightness and you have that quietness deformity, that tiptoe walker, if it improves with knee flexion, that means you have relaxed the gastroc um, soleus in its entirety and that means it 
if you still have tightness with the knee flex, it is truly an Achilles uh, tendon issue. Most I would say would be like B where they're tight with improvement with the knee flexion, which means you relax the gastro, which I, I, means it's a, um, a gastrocnemius tightness. And that's very common in neuromuscular disease. The name of the test is silver scold, S-I-L-V-E-R-S-K-I-O-L-D. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nikki, for putting that. Great. This also allows you to then decide on how you treat it. Because if it's an Achilles tendon issue alone, then you can do a, a percutaneous or tender Achilles lengthening, um, as sort of shown here. Or if it's the gastrocnemius, which in most cases I've found in my patient cohort it is, you can do a gastrocnemius uh, recession, which is essentially lengthening what I tell the parents is the shirt that sits around the muscles and allows it to stretch. Very, very useful. And you don't then have to touch the tendon. Diagnosis. This is the posterior medial bow. What do you do with it? Nothing. Observe. It improves. But what are the further considerations? Leg length discrepancy, two to three centimeters at skeletal maturity. So I just watch these. The most telltale sign is that you can essentially touch the dorsum of the foot up towards the shin. Obviously, the apex of the bow is both uh, posterior and medial. So whenever you see one of these funny bows, look at the apex. Where is it? It's at the back. It's on the inside. It's a posterior medial bow. That will help you a lot when you get to see some of the more complex ones. And as you said, the leg leg discrepancy is the one thing that we watch out for. And we have our very clever ways of guiding growth these days. Diagnosis. This is a, a, a Persian slipper foot or rocker bottom foot. Hopefully you could identify that the talus is almost vertical. Um, and if, if you look at the line, if you draw between the talus and the first ray, it's completely non-linear. They're completely off. How do we manage this? Typically with a reverse Ponsetti casting method. So that would be the first one. So do reverse Ponsetti casting. That essentially loosens up all the soft tissues. And then we do um, an open reduction and wiring of that. Uh, Mohammed's asked uh, number, uh, number 12. Number 12 was poster medial bow. There is no other diagnosis. It's just poster medial bow. So 13, congenital vertical talus, uh, reverse Ponsetti technique and open reduction and casting. And this is the open reduction. You actually actually see you sitting yourself and you wire it re usually, well, you can do it. Um, I do it retrograde like this and you can see I've gone through the base of the first metatarsal into the uh, talus and hold it in that way. Diagnosis of this one. So to be, to be pretty simple about it, look at the bow. So the bow here is again medial. If we show you a lateral, it'll be anterior. This is the anterior medial bow. And this patient has missing lateral rays. Okay, this is fibula hemimelia. And the way you can remember it is uh, it's an anterior medial bow, me familia, fibula hemimelia. Okay, and I'll tell you why, because on the next one, we'll have a look at something else. These are some um, complex and more complicated cases. As you can see, you've got your anterior, it's anterior bow, it's a medial bow, it's much more significant. There is a, a classification. I don't think you really need to know this. Um, and obviously there are, you can either observe it and then there will be reconstruction options. This can also be associated with um, proximal femoral focal deficiency and uh, absence of the ACL. So I have a patient currently with very mild fibula hemimelia, basically has four toes, no significant other findings, a just slightly shorter fibula, uh, has a ball and socket ankle joint and an absent ACL. And so um, we're actually managing his ACL because that's the big issue for them at the moment. Next diagnosis, this is a congenital coxivara. It's bilateral. It's a problem with the ossification of the femoral neck. What are causes for this? Congenital development, it can be autosomal dominant. It could be acquired. It could be following trauma, perthe, Sufi. But, you know, this is an obvious congenital coxivara. What line are we talking about? We're talking about the HE angle, Hilgenbreiner epiphyseal angle. As you can see, the Hilgenbreiner line, the epiphyseal angle. If it's 45 degrees, it's likely to correct. If it's 45 to 60, watch and wait, 60 degrees plus um, surgery, typically, if the femoral neck is less than 110 degrees of uh, angulation, as you can see here. And what I did for this one is I did a bilateral valgus osteotomy. This one may have confused a few of you. This is osteopetrosis, okay, essentially marble bone disease. Um, it's caused for by the pathophysiology, it's a defective osteoclast resorption. 
They have three genetics type, and essentially there's inability to acidify the house ship's lacunae, and there's a lack of ruffled border. That I would say is the um, sort of magic phrase on your FRCS part one is a lack of ruffled border, defective osteoclast. You can't resorb the bone, so it just gets harder and harder and harder. Osteoblasts keep on working, laying down more bone, laying down more bone, and they can actually present with quite significant fractures. Um, and they uh, and because you get this other view, which is a bone within the bone, it can actually end up leading to anemia as the marrow is unable to produce um, hemoglobin. And you can also get increased risk of osteomyelitis, again, because of the stagnant blood flow. A very important case with this, um, I hope you pick this up. This is actually a Ewing's uh, sarcoma. There's the onion skinning found of the periosteum. This was a 15 year old night pain, able to walk, that has pain with an associated swelling. swelling. Further uh, investigation would be MRI scan. You see a significant tumor here uh, and they're large soft tissue components that's hot on the PET scan. And actually about 25 to 30% of them already have metastases on pre um, presentation. If you're doing the part one histology that you tend to find in ortho bullets is round blue cells or pseudo rosettes and treatment is chemo, limb salvage and then radiation. So quite horrible things to have. Um, but important to pick up. This is chronic osteomyelitis. That's the diagnosis. The metaphysis, as the vessels make a sharp turn, basically happens in this area because there's sluggish blood flow. One, what is one? One is sequestrum, necrotic bone, which has been walled off from its own blood supply. And two is the involucrum, okay? A layer of new bone forming outside of the existing bone. So osteomyelitis, chronic osteomyelitis, sequestrum is one, involucrum is two. Apologies. Um, the patient that me and Mark have uh, recently had, this is the Madelung's deformity. Um, that's the diagnosis, essentially a, con uh, a congenital dyschondrosis of the um, distal radial physis on the volar side, um, it's autosomal dominant. You get under inclination, a volar tilt, growth arrest of that part. And um, essentially the anatomical structure is the Vickers ligament, okay? The Vickers ligament, which is the short radiolunate uh, ligament. And that's what you would release uh, in this child, okay? Um, it's autosomal dominant, as I sort of mentioned earlier, and it can be linked to a condition called Larry Wilde dyschondroosteosis, uh, which is where they also get mesomelic dwarfism. This uh, is the x-ray of the foot, painful on the medial side. This is an accessory navicular. Uh, about 10% of the pediatric population have them. 70% of them are bilateral. They're three different types, type one, type two, type three. Um, depending on if the bone is uh, essentially a sesamoid within the tendon, which causes pain, two when it's separate or three when it's just global enlargement. Procedure is a kidna procedure, which is basically open, excise, and advance the tight tibialis posterior tendon on there. Okay, last 10. I know we've, we've uh, gone through a lot already. Bilateral DDH. This is teratological risk factors, firstborn, female, breach, family history, last birth, weight, oligohydramnios, twin pregnancies, take your own pick. Okay, you need to know about the NIP screening that we have in this country. How would you treat it? Well, if you've got a child young enough, um, you can do a close reduction. Unfortunately, in this child, they were five years old, as I mentioned, they needed what I call the full shebang, which is a femoral osteotomy. Short, that's a shortening derotation osteotomy. They don't need a varus. Um, you then do an open reduction and a pelvic osteotomy, and this is the child after they've had staged. This is one just to um, get you in the mix for some, maybe it's even some of the faculty. This is disappearing bone syndrome, which is massive osteolysis with proliferation and dilation of lymphatic vessels. The eponymous name is Gorham Stout syndrome. Okay, Gorham Stout syndrome. Don't need to know this for the exam. It was just in there as an extra. What's happened here? Patella dislocation. Patella femoral instability is very common and it's very complicated. So you need to understand what are the anatomical considerations? Well, has this child got patella alta? Is it too high? Is it sitting within the notch appropriately? Is the notch appropriately formed? That's trochlear dysplasia. Do they have abnormal version of their femur that can subsequently tilt the way that their um, distal femur is like and therefore it slips out? 
Um, you need to know about the TTTG uh, distance, hypermobility in, this, in these kids, and the main um, ligament was the MPFL, MPFL ligament. This child I had, they had a, um, it was patella alta, so we did a, um, a tip top transfer for the child in addition to a, an MPFL, uh, MPFL reconstruction. Nearly there, 25, describe the diagnosis. Okay, once again, let's look where the apex of the bow is. It's anterior and it's lateral. It's an anterolateral bow, okay? Anterolateral bow is congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia, associations, neurofibromatosis. I won't take it more further than that. Um, here we go. There's lots of different things. There's di a whole bunch of different things you can do to um, identify if it is neurofibromatosis. There's seven different types. The vast majority are like this. You need to be looking for cafe au lait spots, um, etc. Okay, this one I said was atraumatic and had been there for a long time. This is actually a congenital pseudoarthrosis of the clavicle. Um, if it was, if we were talking about a fracture, I'd be very keen to tell everyone, do not operate on them. They do heal by themselves. And there's some new papers in the BJJ to say it to um, do that. Um, Mohammed 24 was patellofemoral instability. And we talked about that. Um, so here, congenital arthrosis, and it's essentially failure of fusion between the lateral and medial ossification centers of the clavicle and caused, what's the cause with this, is essentially your um, subclavian artery essentially pulsates and stops it from fusing together. Um, failure of fusion, you get extrinsic compression of the subclavian, more, usually more on the right-hand side, unless the patient has situs invertus. How would you treat it? Well, you round the edges, you can imagine conservatively, but if worse comes to worse, you can fix it as like you would with fracture. Oh, so uh, yeah, we're coming up to, have I, oh, I did, did I miss one? I may have missed one. Oh, apologies to all of those. 23, as you said, um, sorry, I missed this. So go back to your scores. 23, this is an arthrogram. The needle's coming medial. So this is a subadductor because you would go subadductor to medial approach. The diagnosis is obviously DDH. What's number one? It's your dipooling, your medial dipooling because the, um, the hip joint is actually empty. Two is your rose thorn because there's capsular constriction due to the psoas tendon. Apologies, thank you for uh, making me do that. Let's go uh, to 27. 27, we'd already had a supracondylus. I hope you didn't make the same mistake. This is actually a floating elbow. As you can see, the child also has a wrist fracture and an elbow fracture. You have to be aware that there's a high risk of compartment syndrome. You need to be very vigilant with your uh, neurovascular examination. How would you manage it? Well, I wired both on the same day and got them sorted out. 28, severe Sufi. Um, as you can see, risk factors, obesity, hypothyroidism, um, other hypogonadism, skeletal maturity, low vitamin D. Um, there's some new things like acetabular retroversion that have been cited with this. Um, obviously, you want to check if the blood flow is there for vascularity. How would you uh, acutely do this? Well, this is, as uh, one of our colleagues mentioned earlier, which was a, uh, an immediate uh, modified done osteotomy, surgical hip dislocation, identifying the slip, putting it back on, nibbling off the metaphysis, holding it on, and then checking its vascularity. I think if it's an acute severe slip, it would be completely reasonable to say um, I would either discuss with my uh, hip young adult hip colleagues and my pediatric colleagues to perform uh, an urgent uh, reduction, surgical hip dislocation reduction using the done method. I think the fact that you know about that and what the risks are, which is obviously AVN, um, that's absolutely fine. This is the Gantz approach. This is a Gantz surgical dislocation. Okay, we've taken off the greater canter. So I'm just looking at the chat at the same time. Taken off the greater canter, flipped it over, essentially put a wire up the neck into hold that dislocated as one and any role for traction for acute sufi um no um i think unless you're getting to it on the very first day and within the first six hours or 12 hours that's the pash technique where you can do essentially a close reduction and pinning uh, but the avn rates are, are pretty high so i think it'd be pretty safe if you see this that you would refer to a center that manages this regularly um, and you can also do it, as Marcus said, you can do a, an anterior approach, direct anterior approach and do it essentially a sub cuneiform osteotomy. That's the, essentially the fish, uh, which is another one where you leave it in situ, you take out a bit from the neck. But I think this is a pretty standard answer for uh, FRCS. That's what it looks like following. And um, obviously uh, we 
did the other side this is a funny screw it's called a pega screw because this child was only a 10 years old it's a growing screw but i think per, you know contralateral pinning is a debate of its own last two um here we have a significantly short leg proximal femoral focal deficiency or congenital shortening of the femur whichever one you want to talk about um, classification the aitken classification which essentially allows you to say is the femoral head present or absent and then describe how dysplastic the acetabulum is um, this is how would you manage it well most people would say lengthening but if you're ever going to i've never seen this procedure but you know the van ness rotation plus is something we've always wanted to see um most now with growing nails we put wouldn't put nails in and bring them up final one sorry it's taken a while it's the radiolucent lesion surrounded by sclerotic bone it's a nidus what are we looking for what are we looking for this is a osteoid osteoma and um the improvement happens with NSAIDs, i.e. ibuprofen. How do we treat it? Radioablation. Okay. If everyone wants to count up their scores and put them in the box, it'd be great. But I hope that sort of made you quickly feel comfortable with a lot of things you may or may not have seen before. It may just be as helpful for those of you who are waiting to uh, do the part one of the exam as opposed to part two. And I'm sure the FRCS mentors can uh, further quiz you guys on some of the more common topics, but I hope you've now had an understand um, with that. Thanks very much. I'll pass it back to you, Mark.